Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the DBMI seminar. Today's speaker is Dr. Arthi Satyanayana. She is a postdoctoral research fellow in the Department of Biostatistics at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. She also holds an appointment in the Clinical Data Animation Center at Mass Gen Hospital in Harvard Med School. Her research interests are in time variant health data analysis, signal processing, and machine learning. She strives to translate enigmatic health data into actionable insights with an emphasis on digital phenotyping and digital biomarker discovery. Her recent work has focused on developing new methodologies to better understand smartphones, wearables, and EEG data in the context of human health and wellness. Prior to joining Harvard, Arthi received her PhD in computer science from the University of Minnesota, where her dissertation was selected for the university's doctoral dissertation award. Since then, her work has, been, has won multiple junior investigator awards from the National Center of Women and in Information Technology, the American Medical Informatics Association, and the American Epilepsy Society, and the American Clinical Neurophysiology Society. Her expertise has also led her to hold positions at Apple, Intel, the Mayo Clinic, and Boston Children's Hospital. Today, she'll be talking to us about digital phenotyping. And with that, I'll hand it off to her. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. I can just share my screen here. So hi, everyone. I'm Arthi. I'm currently a postdoctoral research fellow, as mentioned, at Harvard in the Department of Biostats. And I also have an affiliation with the Center of Clinical Data Animation at Massachusetts General Hospital and used to be at the Computational Health Informatics Program at Boston Children's Hospital. And I'm excited to be giving you an overview of my work today that's at the intersection of signal processing and machine learning, specifically in how we can quantify human health behavior and physiology from data streams collected at low, medium, and high frequencies. So first of all, what is digital phenotyping? So this is an emerging field. And if you Google the term, you'll find definitions from the founders of the field, John Brownstein, JP Anela, who I'm lucky enough to call a mentor and colleague. But let me give you my definition. And that's digital phenotyping is the technological quantification of health using everyday data. And this can include physiological sensors, social media, smartphone usage, and it builds on Richard Dawkins' idea of an extended phenotype where a person's behavior and interactions with their environment contribute to who they are and how their health is. And it can also be an incredible tool towards preventable health issues. So today I'm gonna to focus on sensor data. When monitoring the human condition for wellness, performance, or for pathologic state, there are a variety of sensors that can be used. Smartphones and wearables are of course ubiquitous and collect a lot of information about our daily life. But there are other higher frequency tools that while not currently pervasive are increasing in popularity. And today I'm going to include EEGs in this category and I'll show you why. So each of these data streams presents different challenges and requires different approaches. As I mentioned, EEGs collect data at very high frequencies, usually between 256 to over 1,000 hertz. And they use electrodes that are placed on the scalp and measure the electrical activity of the brain. EEGs are one of the most underutilized data sources in healthcare today. And a huge barrier to their widespread adoption is a lack of tools to auto-interpret them. And we'll talk about how this can be overcome. Next, we'll talk about a medium frequency data source, wearables or specifically the most commonly used smartwatches. Actigraphy is standard in most, and some wearables also collect GPS data. Some use electrodes, such as the latest Apple Watch. And many now use photoplethysmography to track heart rate, oxygen saturation, and other biometric signals. It's actually one of the areas I focused on when I worked at Apple. And lastly, smartphones. While capable of collecting continuous data, in reality, smartphones collect data intermittently or at low frequency, and it's for a practical reason, to preserve battery life. They can track a person's GPS data, their communication patterns, and in parallel also collect patient reported outcomes. And all of these data streams give insight into the routine and mobility of an individual and work as a proxy for physical activity, social behavior, mental health, or even mood. And this is of course not an exhaustive list. There are many more data streams available and becoming available. And each of these data sources contribute to this larger picture, the cells to society understanding of human health. 
And while there's work needed to be done on each of those pieces of the puzzle, there's also work that needs to be done in combining this multi-frequency data to be meaningful together. So to give you an idea of how digital phenotyping approaches can be used in biomedical research, I'm gonna give you an overview of several in progress and published projects, starting with EEG data, moving to wearable data, and ending with some ongoing work with smartphone data. And I hope that this overview inspires you to think about how these methods and data streams can contribute to your own areas of work. And if you're interested, please reach out and we can talk in more detail about any of these projects. So let's start talking about EEGs. I'm going to assume no prior knowledge here so that we can all be on the same page. So if you're an EEG expert, just bear with me a second. As I mentioned, EEGs are taken by placing electrodes on the scalp of a patient and recording the electrical activity of the brain. Currently, that signal is split into alpha, beta, theta, and delta waves, and a neurologist visually inspects the recording and determines a diagnosis or the status of a patient. As I mentioned earlier, EEGs are one of the most underutilized data sources in healthcare today, and it's because the normal procedure requires clinicians to manually read these signals. And these signals are recorded for hours, days, even weeks, and downsampled to at a minimum of 126 hertz. So if you're thinking this sounds impossible to manually read efficiently, you're not wrong. Especially because the actual pathologic activity they're searching for can occur in just a fraction of a second. And as you can imagine, there's often a lack of consensus across multiple neurologists. So let's take a look at a real EEG. So each bar here is one second long. So this is about an eight second excerpt out of a longer EEG, which could be hours or days long. Epileptologists are trained to be able to read and identify the pathologic activity from these and then determine the diagnosis. For example, an interictal epileptiform discharge or an IED is a biomarker for epilepsy and seizure risk. Different types of IEDs in an EEG indicate different types of epilepsy. So here I've identified a series of spikes in this EEG that appear to occur in the central temporal region of the brain. And so this EEG is indicative of a patient with Rolandic epilepsy. None of the other brain activity in this EEG is pathologic. So you can see how specific that morphology of the signal needs to be. Moreover, 45% of patients with have a sleep-related epilepsy. 45% of patients with epilepsy have a sleep-related epilepsy, meaning they tend to seize mostly at night which makes capturing that abnormal brain activity on a routine EEG particularly difficult. So my goal has been to determine if there's something fundamentally different occurring in a patient's brain, even when they're not having an epileptic event. And so I took a nonlinear modeling approach to capturing the electrodynamics of the brain. The input to the model would be that raw EEG interval, and it could be as short as 30 seconds or as long as your computing power can manage. And the output will essentially be a 3D matrix that theoretically captures the complete nonlinear dynamics of that EEG interval. So the three dimensions here are the EEG sensors, the nonlinear measures, and the frequency bands. As I mentioned, EEGs are taken by placing electrodes on the scalp, and most clinical EEGs today have about 19 sensors. The names of the placement positions of those EEG sensors are what you're seeing across the x-axis here. The y-axis contains the nonlinear measures, and these are the metrics that we compute from the EEG. The determinism, laminarity, Lyapunov exponents, entropy, recurrence rate, et cetera. And all of these metrics capture the signal processing complexity of the EEG. And we'll talk more about those later. The z-axis here are the wavelets or the frequency bands that we compute each of these metrics on. So we pulled 60 EEG excerpts from patients whose EHR said they'd been diagnosed with a sleep-related epilepsy. In this case, it's benign childhood epilepsy with central temporal spikes. I then worked with a neurologist to select intervals from their EEG that had no spikes or epileptiform activity, and to confirm that those excerpts look visually normal and would be diagnosed as so. I also selected a set of normal EEGs from patients without epilepsy to use as controls and ran this nonlinear analysis on both. So here are some of the results represented as a multi-frequency graphs for sample entropy. So the x-axes here are the frequency and the y-axes are the sample entropy value. 
the red curves are patients with epilepsy, and those teal blue curves are patients without epilepsy. And the confidence intervals are indicated by the shaded area. Now, entropy is a measure of chaos in the signal. But regardless of that definition, we can visually see that these curves are different across these four randomly selected electrode placements on the brain. And for the most part, at some points, the confidence intervals are separate too. As I mentioned, every EEG looked normal to an epileptologist. However, this analysis was able to identify the patients with epilepsy just by plotting these multi-frequency curves. And here we have another nonlinear measure. So here's trapping time. But we can also see a distinct difference between the curves, even more so with this one. This is for L max. And lastly, L mean. Now each of these measures computes a different component of complexity within the electrodynamics of the brain. But without diving into the details of phase space and control theory, the key takeaway here is just that there is a measurable difference between the EEGs of patients with epilepsy and those without, even when there are no visibly observable markers to a neurologist. This image further highlights those differences. So here we have the epilepsy brain on the left and the control brain on the right. And following this rainbow scale of sample entropy values, it's clear that the region highlighted in yellow, which is the central temporal region of the epilepsy brain on the left, is in a very different dynamical state. It's bright blue as opposed to this orange or yellow shade. And as I mentioned, the patients in this cohort have a particular type of epilepsy that results in spiking in the central temporal region. So this area is generally the problem area for these patients. However, spiking did not occur during these EEGs. There were no visually identifiable abnormalities. So even when a seizure or a spike is not occurring, the epileptic brain is still fundamentally dynamically different to the controls. And we saw similar results for the other nonlinear measures too. So in summary, using these nonlinear metrics, we've taken the first step towards being able to actually see what can't be seen in an EEG. And this is quite an exciting breakthrough in epilepsy diagnostics for which we were fortunate to win the Young Investigator Award from the American Clinical Neurophysiology Society. And we also presented preliminary results at AMIA, if anyone was there, and published the final work in scientific reports. You can find out more of the details on there. So nonlinear measures are effective at phenotyping epilepsy diagnoses from EEGs. And that inspired me to see if, they could, if we could also use this approach to identify the status within a patient that we already know has epilepsy. So can we find a digital biomarker of the brain's propensity to seize? So here we collected a data set of pre-surgical phase one patients with various types of epilepsy that were admitted to Boston Children's Hospital for inpatient monitoring. And this means that I could take advantage of a unique paradigm. So during this long-term monitoring, patients are weaned off of their medications so that neurologists can identify which part of the brain is causing seizures. This gives us patients that are on a high amount of medication and those same patients when they're on a low amount of medication. And the significance is that when patients are not on medication, their brain is more likely to have a seizure. The propensity of the brain to seize increases, or the term is the epileptogenicity of the brain increases. So for this study, I conducted recurrence quantitative analysis, which basically computes six nonlinear measures trapping time, L-mean, L-max, L-entropy, determinism, and recurrence rate. And these are multi-frequency graphs again, where we can see a stark difference in the curves for patients on high or low medication levels. And these are showing the confidence intervals. You can see how clear that difference is. It's more, even more obvious here. So these visualizations are showing the change in the brain as medication is weaned. So each bra brain diagram is actually showing the difference in value within a patient's brain for trapping time on the left, TT, and L-mean on the right. In this study, the patients had various types of epilepsy. And so the problem area, the seizure onset zone, is different for every patient and was computed as such. So the yellow highlighted area here is just for visualization. But we can again see that the problem area in the brain, in this case, the part of the brain where seizures initiate, reacts differently to medication weaning than the rest of the brain for L max and L entropy, and for determinism and recurrence rate. So this means that we can measure the effect of medication on the brain non-invasively from an EEG and in real time. 
that also means that we may be able to identify the part of the brain that is causing the seizures in real time. And that would have incredible implications for clinical care as this process currently takes a week of inpatient monitoring. Moreover, this work takes a first big step towards identifying a digital biomarker for the brain's propensity to seize. We presented the preliminary results for this work at the American Epilepsy Society's annual meeting and it won the Young Investigator Award there too. And the full manuscript is currently under review, so stay on the lookout for that. But in the meantime, the key takeaway of those results indicate that not only can nonlinear analysis improve diagnostics, but it can also identify the health status of a patient. And today I showed you cases for epilepsy because epilepsy has a physical observable manifestation of what's going on in the brain through seizures. But we're also looking at using these approaches to understand sleep and cognition and aging. There's still so many unanswered questions in this work. Despite that, EEGs are not quite wearables yet. So next let's talk about wearables, specifically smartwatches. So smartwatches on the market today generally summarize past behavior and give nice visualizations to the user of their patterns and trends. But moving forward, the idea is that from tracking a person's physical activity, we'd be able to create a model that forecasts outcomes. For example, using actigraphy data to predict a person's sleep quality that night. And sleep has become quite a hot topic these days, especially sleep tracking with wearable devices. I just got the Whoop wristband for Christmas this year, and it does such a great job of tracking my sleep. However, learning about the previous night's sleep is great information, but it's not empowering anyone to improve their sleep quality. So a prediction algorithm that was based on actigraphy could. And so that's what I've created. So here we have an anecdotal example of a person's counts per minute over time. With my collaborators at Cornell, we collected data from 100 adolescents wearing an Actigraph GT3X, and I automated the sleep annotation using a state machine. I then computed whether or not they had good or poor sleep quality based on a threshold of sleep efficiency and put the awake portion of the activity time series into a model to see if it could predict sleep quality. So just a little bit of syntax. For the following models, X of T is the vector representation of an individual's activity. The output layer or the prediction defines a Bernoulli distribution over the sleep quality metric for good or poor binary classification. And all of the results are from models trained to minimize the cross entropy between the predicted and the target distribution. I used a grid search to determine the optimal hyperparameters for each model. And if I just direct your attention to the table on the bottom right, I have the results for several models. I tested a linear regression, a multi-layer perceptron, a convolutional neural network, a recurrent neural network, and a recurrent neural network with a long short-term memory cell. But ultimately, I designed a custom time-batched LSTM architecture, and that's what you're seeing throughout the slide. The input data from actigraphy is very low dimensional, but it's a long time series. And despite being the preferred model for time series data, the RNN struggle to create feature maps from only one feature per epoch. Moreover, it would seem that LSTMs resulted in a vanishing or exploding gradient. All of this is just to say that in order to manage the specific dimensions of actigraphy data, I created these zero padded batches of time with length S, which is borrowing an idea from CNNs and bringing it to RNNs and created a method called time batched LSTMs which was the best model of all with an AUC of 0.97 and an F1 score of 0.92. So this gives us a model that can predict sleep quality based on actigraphy data or based on a person's physical activity. We can then focus on the next step. We can predict sleep quality, but can we change it? Specifically, can we optimize sleep quality through physical activity? Can we make a physical activity behavior recommendation? So if we go back to this image I showed earlier of a person's counts per minute over time, we need to characterize the behaviors that are contributing to this good or poor sleep quality. And I did this by characterizing the personalized exertion level of the individual into categories of light, sedentary, moderate, and vigorous activity. And I did this by identifying the changes in exertion by searching for statistically significant change points in an individual's own personal physical activity. So this is looking at only their own actigraphy data. 
I did that by using a hierarchical divisive clustering approach to segment the signal by maximizing the divergence between any split in the time series. And I set the maximum permutations to 99 and looked for a p-value better than 0.01. So to check if these exertion metrics were aligned with good or poor sleep quality, I used the percentage time spent in each category as input into a model predicting sleep quality. And then I used Adaboost, random forest, support vector machines, and logistic regression. And as you can see from these results, this simple characterization of the data still did have predicted value. So now we're one step closer to a behavior recommendation. Thanks to the TBLSTM architecture and the human activity recognition algorithm I just mentioned, we can make a prediction of sleep quality and also interpret how an individual's physical activity contributes to it. The next step is making a recommendation. So far, we've taken a person's entire actigraphy time series during the day and then predicted their sleep quality. So here, T sub 100 indicates the time where we have 100% of the daily activity time series, and R indicates the real sleep quality. We need to move this prediction back to some time T where we can proactively predict the expected sleep quality with incomplete information and then advise the user to take action towards improving their sleep quality. So P here, P here represents the prediction of sleep quality based on that sleep efficiency threshold. And then P of zero equals poor sleep and P of one equals good sleep. So to test this proof of concept, I wanted to validate it on retrospective data, make a prediction of sleep quality indicated by P, make a recommendation to improve sleep quality, and then compare it to the real sleep quality marked here as R. So let's start by defining those recommendations. So that human activity recognition algorithm I described vectorized the personalized exertion level of an individual throughout the day into light, medium, moderate, vigorous um, activity. So for each individual, we have the percentage time they spent in each of those modes. I then use the Kalinsky Arabesque Index or the variance ratio criterion to select the number of clusters to create and did a k-means clustering. And this is using a partial actigraphy vector up to some time t in the day. So that means actigraphy vectors that are in the same cluster exhibit similar behavior or exertion levels between time zero and time t. Then within each cluster, I subclustered using the same method. However, these subclusters were now using that full actigraphy time series from zero to 100. So two signals within the same outer cluster, but in different subclusters, which show similar behavior until time t, but different behavior after time t. Then computing the good to bad sleep ratio in each subcluster and filtering on a threshold, here I'm using two, gives us target clusters for good or poor sleep quality. The centroids of each subcluster with a ratio above two make an ideal behavioral recipe that leads to good sleep. Now, each of these recipes would be unique to a user and their own exertion level variation. So when a recommendation needs to be made, it will be determined by computing the user's distance from each behavioral recipe centroid to identify the closest and suggest how a user should exert themselves for the remainder of the day. So to test this, I validated on retrospective data. So there are six possibilities going from left to right. If good sleep quality is predicted, no recommendation needs to be made and the sleep quality is either good or something changes and it actually ends up being poor. If poor sleep quality is predicted, that's when our engine will kick in and there are four possible outcomes, A, B, C, and D. For A, a person is predicted to have poor sleep, they follow the recommendation and then they end up having good sleep. The recommendation works. B indicates the case where the recommendation is faulty the user has followed the recommendation, but still had poor sleep. C is the case where a user is predicted to have poor sleep, doesn't follow the recommendation, but somehow improves their sleep quality and has good sleep. And D indicates the case where the user does not follow the recommendation and thus does not have good sleep as predicted. So a successful recommendation system would maximize A relative to B and D relative to C. So I retrospectively evaluated this approach on 636 individuals who were predicted to have poor sleep quality. Of those, 81% of recommendations that were followed resulted in good sleep quality. 
and 79% of recommendations that weren't followed led to poor sleep. And this illustrates that this method for developing personalized behavioral recipes for optimized sleep quality works. And I'd love to test this in a clinical trial in the future. So now we have this complete cycle using a time-batched LSTM to predict sleep quality from actigraphy, a human activity recognition algorithm to draw insight from the actigraphy, and a behavior recommendation system using subclustering to optimize and improve sleep. And this work received an award from NCWIT, the National Center of Women and in Information Technology, and the different components have been published in multiple venues. Specifically, the deep learning model is in JMIR M Health, the human activity recognition model at ICDM, and the recommendation system in IEEE Computer. This work was also selected for the best dissertation award for the year I graduated because these approaches can be used to model many other health outcomes. That being said, one of the key obstacles to launching this at scale is that the wearable market has no standard output and uses proprietary algorithms without sharing that raw data. So we're currently launching a sub-study as part of the larger nurses health study, where we'll collect wearables and smartphone data from 15 nurses over 14 days. And we're going to be using an Actigraph, a Fitbit, and smartphones with an app called BB to see if we can draw parallels between these different data sets and normalize these outputs. The wearable market, of course, continues to expand and as many more sensors become integrated into the devices, there are more opportunities for digital phenotyping. So lastly, let's talk about my current projects, which are using smartphone data. As I mentioned, some of the key data streams that we collect from smartphones are GPS and communication records. In the real world, GPS data is collected as little as 10% of the time in cycles of one minute on and nine minutes off. And this makes the data quite sparse and intermittent. Communication data is of course discrete and not continuous. We're talking about how long someone takes to respond to a text message, how many people they talk on the phone to, etc. But to interpret these data streams in the context of an individual, we need to look at trends over time. So we create these summary statistics that aggregate the data at a uniform level, no matter the device. And these summary statistics are crucial to tapping into the data that smartphones track both for clinicians and researchers, but also the individual. Telling a user about the maximum amplitude of their mobility waveform is completely meaningless, but sharing that there's been a decrease in the length of time they spend continuously active over the last few weeks could be meaningful from the perspective of recovery. Their body may have decreased in performance. And that's that trajectory piece where we model these metrics over time to gain insight. So here are just some of the summary statistics that our team has developed. We have many more. As I mentioned, the GPS data is sparse. And so first we conduct missing value imputation. For most cases, these, for most cases, these summaries are aggregated at the daily level. So the amount of time spent at home in a day, spent in continuous movement, spent stationary, the number of significant locations visited, the proportion of time spent at each. We also compute some basic information on the communication data such as the number and length of texts and calls, the reciprocity of each, the in degree and out degree, meaning how many unique people are they receiving or sending texts or calls from. And all of these metrics are available through a tool we've been developing called Forest. In order to translate our work into having real utility for researchers, we're making everything open source and available on GitHub. Forest builds on top of BB, which is a research platform that our lab created a few years ago. It includes an app that users install on their smartphone and it collects all the relevant data streams uniformly. Forest is a Python library that takes that smartphone output and automatically computes and models each of these metrics. We're currently working on connecting it to AWS and channeling all that data directly to Tableau for visualization. Again, so that non-technical researchers can really use this tool. We currently have a couple trees as we call them, AKA Python packages available through Forest. Willow, which computes the mobility or GPS metrics. Jasmine, which computes the communication metrics. A survey package called Sycamore, which allows us to compare the objective data streams with patient reported outcomes. We're also working on an actigraphy and a sleep and circadian rhythm package that will come out later this year. 
And all of these packages help compute metrics and trajectories that essentially capture behavioral traits, track behavioral changes, and help with the early detection of abnormal or unexpected behaviors. And I'm currently leading three new projects that do each one of these. The first is with Stanford identifying smartphone measurable objective markers of autism spectrum disorder. The second is with a pharmaceutical company called Bollringer Ingelheim, where we're using forest and BB to measure exploratory endpoints in a clinical trial for an antidepressant. And the third is with the neurosurgical team at Brigham Women's, where I'm developing new methods to model post-surgical recovery trajectories. So you can see a wide breadth of types of studies that this works for. The Stanford study is a small pilot study to assess the feasibility of using smartphones to identify traits common to ASD. In particular, we're collecting GPS data, communication history, and a series of 10 survey questions. For example, some of the questions we're asking are, have they exercised today? How are they feeling today? Did they eat breakfast? Did they snack, et cetera? We'll also have the patients complete cognitive behavioral questionnaires, the social responsiveness scale, the SRS2, and the autism spectrum quotient. And this study is currently in progress. So we don't yet have the results from those questionnaires, but here's a preview of the types of data that we're collecting and the patients and the patterns that we can already see in patients. So here I've plotted the data from two patients, patient one and patient two. Patient one's average daily distance traveled is shown in gray and patient two's is in green. So from this graph, we can objectively observe that patient one travels a greater distance every day compared to patient two, and is generally more mobile according to their GPS data. We can also observe based on communication records that patient two speaks on the phone more often than texting, while patient one uses mostly text messages or multimedia messages. The top graph here is the number of calls daily, and the bottom is text messages. So patient two makes around two phone calls a day, most days, but sometimes more than 10. Patient one, on the other hand, rarely has more than two phone calls a day, but sends hundreds of text messages a day. That peak we're seeing in February shows they sent over 1,500 texts that day. And if we dive a little deeper, we can see that even though patient two makes a lot of phone calls daily, the duration of those calls is quite short, less than 10 minutes with the exception of a phone call in March that lasted almost an hour. In contrast, when patient one has phone calls, they seem to be a little bit longer. We saw that patient one sends hundreds of texts a day and even thousands on that occasion. And if we look at the text out degree here in the bottom graph, we can see that on the day that they sent those 1500 text messages, they were to 200 different people or at least 200 unique phone numbers. And there are several days where they're texting 50 unique phone numbers, while patient two seems to speak to a small group of people regularly. As a result, when the patients were asked about the number of meaningful interactions they had per day, patient one reported having less than five meaningful interactions, while patient two reported having more than 15. Now these patients are at extremes that I selected for illustrative purposes. And all of this data is interesting in identifying patterns of behavior and even perception. But once we have those cognitive behavioral questionnaires, we can really start to understand how these behavior trajectories and what they mean in the context of ASD and instantly visualize patterns that could be indicative of their condition. As for the Bowringer Ingelheim study, this is a formal decentralized clinical trial to test the efficacy of a new antidepressant medication. Together, we're using smartphones to collect exploratory endpoints. So can we match the trajectory of a patient's behavior to how well the medication is working? And this is a unique situation where there are clearly defined controlled and test groups. The trial is currently underway and enrollment is ongoing, but we should reach about 110 patients in the next couple of months. And it illustrates that this, um, this pro project illustrates the potential of these methods to be used in real world problems. So stay tuned for results from this work over the next few months. For the third project, the Brigham study, we're using smartphone data to collect the same data streams. But this time we asked the patients to share their daily pain level. Generally after surgery, these pain levels spike, drastically drop and then plateau. However, the time frame over which they improve differs, the daily fluctuation of their pain differs, and the overall recovery trajectory differs. 
Moreover, pain is notoriously difficult for patients to quantify. So step one was just to see if these objective markers of mobility correlate with patient reported pain scores. So here I plotted the pain scores for one patient against their daily distance traveled. And we can instantly observe that as pain decreases post-surgery, the mobility of the patient increases. On an aggregate level for a group of 100 patients, we found that an average increase in pain by 0.1 was associated with a 2.8 fold decrease in the average length of a patient's daily flight, a 5.1 fold decrease in the largest distance a patient traversed, and a 6.0 fold decrease in a patient's distance traveled that day. The flight length refers to a continuous straight path movement. So decreases in flight length may indicate decreases in confidence and comfort in going places. Decreases in the largest distance traveled daily may mean patients are staying closer to home. And a decrease in the total distance traveled means patients are going to fewer places as well as staying closer to home. So objectively measured mobility could work as a proxy to infer pain. And each of these projects is using BWE and Forest to leverage smartphone data and quantify human behavior, validating these digital phenotyping approaches for de developmental disorders, mental health, and surgical recovery. And that's just an overview of these three key pieces of the puzzle. The world of time variant digital health data is exploding and each of these components I dove into today are just a small piece of this larger puzzle. And I look forward to developing each of these and maybe collaborating with many of you in these areas to partner and grow our understanding of the human condition. And I know I went through a lot, but I just wanna leave you with three key takeaways today. The first is just how effective nonlinear measures are at analyzing this continuous data. The second is how by using wearables, we were not only able to measure sleep, but we could predict sleep. And most importantly, we could make behavior recommendations that would ultimately improve sleep. And lastly, that by passively collecting smartphone data, we can track physiological and mental changes in a patient without any burden to their lifestyle. And all of these digital phenotyping methods can deepen our understanding of human health on a personal level, as well as a population level. And I hope today's overview encourages some of you to incorporate these types of data streams in your own studies. To find out more about any of the work I just talked about today, please check out my Google Scholar or website or GitHub. And I must end by thanking the incredible mentors and collaborators I have without who none of this work would have been possible. So please don't hesitate to reach out and email to me. I'd love to talk about any of these projects in more detail and answer any questions that you have right now. Great. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Safia Narana. Um, we're just um, so happy to have you here. And that was really, really fascinating work. Um, let's open it up for questions. Uh, I've got a question. Great, go ahead. Uh, thank you for a phenomenal talk. Uh, my name is Pierre Elias. I'm a cardiology fellow here, and I'm doing my postdoc in the Prot Lab uh, here in DBMI. Uh, Ken Mandel is also a good friend, so please oh, okay. say hi. Um, uh, so there's a lot of really fascinating work. We work a lot with waveform data, particularly electrocardiograms. And so I had two questions for you about some of your EEG work. Yeah. So the, the first is, um, as you mentioned, you know, there's alpha wave, beta wave, so on and so forth. You have multiple quote unquote leads that are being generated. And one thing we've seen in the electrocardiography world is um, there's very little consensus about uh, what a multi waveform image is. So some people treat it with 2D convolution, some people treat it with 1D convolution, some people use gated recurrent units and LSTMs. And we've seen kind of a huge variety of different approaches, but not a lot of consensus. So I'd love to hear just your thoughts on after having run it with 1D CNNs, 2D CNNs and, and other things, um, did you see anything uh, come out of the waveform, uh, kind of come out as a consensus around the waveform data that you're using with EEGs? And the second question is, did you um, at any point look at um, the ways that you could um, 
take EEG data that was collected at different time intervals and create that into a single input. So someone had like an EEG done a year ago. And then rather than just learning from one EEG, knowing what that patient's prior baseline was from a prior EEG to uh, um, uh, potentially inform the model one way or another. Yeah, so I'll start with your second question, um, which is kind of looking at EEGs over time. That's something I haven't looked at yet, but it's something we're starting to look at specifically from the perspective of cognitive development and how, you know, with these pediatric patients, especially with, with Bechts, which is the benign childhood epilepsy, these patients are, as, they, as you look at different age groups, patients generally outgrow the condition towards the, you know, the preteens and teens. So looking at different age groups, you know, you're going to see a different type of um, EEG, especially as you look at the way younger um, infants who are still developing their brains. So we're looking into doing that. We haven't done it yet. Um, and this work has also been done, these sort of approaches with autism um, or high risk autism patients. So, and there've been early results um, that are published as well on that. So that they definitely do have a way of looking at that and are able to find patterns over time. For your first question, um, we haven't looked at doing any sort of deep learning on the EEGs right now. And part of that is just we're testing for all these different nonlinear measures. We've got this 3D tensor and we could put it through a CNN, but most of the criticism or I shouldn't say criticism, but the most of the pushback that we get from neurologists is around even these nonlinear measures and their physiological explanations aren't clear yet. So adding another black box on top of them sounds a little bit more confusing rather than trying to dive into what these measures mean. So we've sort of stayed away from doing anything like that yet. Does it's that kind of answer your question? It does, it does. Um, and I, I noticed that like, you had all of the things for LSTMs and the like uh, when you were moving into the, the sensor data. So that's super interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great, other questions? I have a quick question. Jump in. Okay, great. Nobody else jumped in it. Just the same time as me. Perfect. Um, thanks. That was a really, really super uh, interesting talk. Um, one question I had is about the second portion on physical activity and recommendations. Um, and wondering if you could speak a little bit more to what those recommendations would look like, like delivered to a person, like in the context of a clinical trial. Because from what I understand, what you're talking about, like looking at sort of different clusters or like if your physical activity this afternoon looks a little bit more like this, you'll sleep better. Um, is that understanding correct? And just like what, what are your thoughts on how that deliver recommendation could be delivered to a to a person? Yeah. So the, the algorithmic output that you would get from that would be um, for each of those categories: so sedentary, light, moderate, and vigorous activity. Um, depending on what time they wanted to go to sleep, it would ask, give them a recommendation of how many minutes to spend in each category. Mm -hmm. Now, how to deliver that to a patient is sort of a HCI question and you know how to visualize that data for them. Um, so I haven't looked into that yet, but I love, I hope my presentation shows how much I love good visualizations that show mm -hmm. interesting things to people in an understandable way. And I think that that would be a really fascinating thing to look at. And I'm really interested in looking at that. Very cool, thanks. Yeah. Uh, I have a couple questions. Uh, maybe I can jump in here. No one else. Yeah. Go for it. Uh, so one question I had about uh, the sleep recommendation aspect was uh, you're looking at actig actigraphy data and there's presumably a lot of other explanations for poor sleep as well, like stress or other things. Wondering if you thought about looking at other data sources for that. And my second question is, I guess, more uh, technical. Um, on the time batched LSTM, could you explain a little bit how that approach came about and what problem you were looking to solve with that? Is it basically like discretizing this non, this continuous input that's not regularly sampled? Uh, and yeah. So. Yeah. So for um, your, what was your first question? I already forgot it. Oh, I'll answer your second question first, just in case. Sure. So in terms of the model, what the, the problem that we were trying to solve is so that this, we were trying to play around with whether and make no assumptions on whether the uh, there was time variance or non-time variance that were playing into this. So for example, if a person is 
uh, works out in the morning versus working out at night. So we tried to play around with the different models looking at that. So CNN is time invariant. It doesn't matter what time you look at it. And we saw great results with the CNN. The minute we applied an RNN, it wasn't able to, you know, the, the prediction level went way down. It was like 60, 65% or so. And so why was adding this time variance part not being relevant to it, which kind of makes sense. You know, if somebody does a five mile run in the morning or at night, it's still a physical exertion activity and it should still affect their sleep quality potentially. But then when we added the LSTMs and we added these other layers, being able to track the, um, you know, the surrounding data around a data point. So for example, when we're making this prediction at night, looking at what they immediately did before that prediction was made and focusing on that and pro providing a little bit more information on that for the model, improved the prediction, which again makes sense if somebody exercises right before they go to bed, it might have some impact on their sleep quality. And we're not making any assumptions on whether it's good or poor for any particular person. We're just building the model to predict it for that person themselves. So this TBLSTM approach basically borrowed the time batching and time invariance factor from CNNs, which is created from you know, looking at a batch of data at the same time, as opposed to an individual time point. And we took that and applied it to an LSTM sort of architecture where now instead of tracking the, you know, the last, I guess an LSTM's um, famous for their, their memory, right? They can track the important parts and keep it relevant to the model. So we were now doing, instead of tracking individual points and keeping it relevant to the model, it's batches that are being tracked into the model. So it just makes more sense in terms of, instead of looking at a minute by minute importance of someone's activity by the day, we're now looking at batches of behavior over the day. So I think that's really why that model worked better. Can Got you just it. remind me what your first question was? Yeah, again? sure. The, the first question was just on um, if you thought about incorporating other sources uh, other yeah. than actigraphy. Yeah. Yeah. So of course, if someone has caffeine or any of these other things that could, could affect um, their sleep quality as well. One thing I'm really interested in looking at is incorporating smartphone data because a lot of times when people are sedentary, it's because they're on their phone. They're actually using a lot of exertion. It's just mental exertion instead of physical exertion. And that no doubt affects their sleep quality too. That could be a proxy for stress. It could be a proxy for you know, just screen time. And so being able to understand what sedentary behavior is, it's not always relaxing. You know, When we're working, we're all sedentary all day. I don't think we would count it as relaxing time. So I think there's definitely an importance to incorporate these other data streams. Um, and I'm, I think smartphone um, usage is one of the first ones I want to look at. Great, thanks. Yeah, thanks for the questions. Great, other questions? I have a small question. Um, hi, I really enjoyed the presentation. I thought it was very interesting and engaging, so thank you. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask about, um, in the last section, the study at Stanford with ASD, I'm, I thought, I think it's like really interesting to look at kind of these, you know, input output communication behaviors, and as well as with the survey that you were mentioning about like engaging or meaningful um, mm -hmm. interactions. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more, I don't know if you're able to yet, about what kind of the implications of those results are and how that kind of informs an understanding of ASD or like what specific patterns are maybe interesting or are we looking for? Yeah, so we're still in really early stages of that project. And um, we're, you know, we're really going into it in an exploratory phase. So we're, we don't have, um, I mean, I'm sure some people may have some hypotheses, but we're sort of going into an exploratory perspective of let's see if there are behavioral implications and how this works. And this is in a, a cohort of like early college students, so like about 18, 19 year olds who, um, you know, how is this affecting them and how are their behaviors changing? So we're hoping to, we're expecting to see that communication, um, you know, the duration of communication and the frequency of communication will likely have huge implications on, you know, how they're feeling, what their um, moods are, how easy they find communication, you know, what, where the fear is coming from and all these sorts of components to their state. Um, mobility, we really don't know what to expect from that in terms of, you know, how, you know, what is their, are they leaving home a lot? Are they spending a lot of time outdoors? Of course, this is all data collected during COVID. So how interesting is that mobility data really going to be? I'm not sure. 
Um, but communication record, the information is really what I think we'll find key patterns in. Great, thank you. Hi, this is Hanjin from NYP. I, I'm just uh, very, very fascinated by your talk and it's extremely very, you know, um, like I like to see that actually you have used sample entropy as one of your nonlinear dynamic, you know, measures for your epilepsy study, right? Actually, I turned out I just happened to be from the group who invented this measure. So <laughs> I, I'm very excited to see that. And, uh, and actually, I, I think that it actually makes sense to me that uh, sample entropy works here because the pattern you're identifying is saying that there is like spontaneous, like uh, the spikes, and then the others are pretty flat and low variability kind of situation, which actually the, the, the sample entropy is measuring the probability, even basically if two points, for example, if the epic is less of two, 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 if two epics, two points that matches in another segment, then what's the probability? The third point would also match. So that's the that's the idea, right? So because you have only those very small number of transient, like you know, spikes, right? This very happens not very often. That's why the probability will be low compared to your if it's sine if it's sine waves, right? It happens a lot. Then your probability is very high. So obviously they are very different. So that's so, why. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, in that study, we were looking at in the in the two EEGs that we were comparing, neither of them had any spikes. So. Um, there may have been some small, not visibly identifiable differences. I mean, clearly there were some non-visibly identifiable differences between the signals, but there were no spikes or no obvious um, variations in the signal. Oh, that's interesting. And still, the sample entropy distinguished between them two? Yeah, and it could still Oh, wow. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, yeah. wow. That's interesting. That's fascinating to see that. Thank yeah, you. That Thank you for that. Surprise yeah, actually, that. I mm -hmm. go ahead. No, that's that's exactly um, the key takeaway. There is that these two intervals look normal, and neurologists could say that these both these EEG intervals look normal. There's no visible spiking. There's nothing, um, but sample entropy could still pick up on some electrical dynamic differences between the two. Wow. Okay. If you don't mind, I'd like to follow up with you. It's very fascinating. Yeah, I, actually, I would like to follow up with you because I have some questions. One of the big <laughs> questions we get when we present this type of work at conferences are what, how does spiking and how does epileptiform activity change the sample entropy? Because, for example, if we're looking at, you know, the sample entropy of an EEG over, you know, the intervals that I showed were 30 second intervals, maybe 60 seconds for some of them. But what if we're looking at five minutes of an interval and we're computing sample entropy and the epileptiform activity is happening in a fraction of a second and pure, it might happen you know, a few times during that five minutes, but now when we're looking at two different patients that the slight difference in those you know, fraction of a second segments makes a huge difference in the type of epilepsy they have. So now sample entropy, how does it change when there's just slightly you know, when we're looking at a large signal with very, very small variations in it, is it going to be able to pick up on that? Is it not? Um, and how does it change with spikes yeah. versus slow yeah. rate versus all these other? Yeah, that's a good question. Yes, I, my 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 bias is that it might be diluted by other, you yeah. know, noisy data which would dominate this probabilities. As I told, as I said before, it might be. Yeah. But let's cut it offline. I'm very excited. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Someone gave you $50 million tomorrow. What would you build? <laughs> Ooh, all sorts. <laughs> um, well, first, I think, you know, a lot of this EEG work, we're trying to look at EEGs of young patients, and portable EEGs are becoming more common. But they're not great for really young infants, right? We need a really, really small EEG that can work on an infant and track these changes. And specifically, as we're starting to look at um, cognitive development using these nonlinear measure approaches, um, we need an EEG that can actually track infant brain waves at, you know, in a very small little brain. So that would be one thing I would build. Um, another would be. 
well, I'd hire a lawyer to get all these wearable companies to start being a little bit more open or transparent or uh, you know, give a standard output that these algorithms can work with, because I think that's what patients want. That's what people who are buying wearables, they're tracking this information for their health and their wellness. So incorporating that into an EHR, we need to have, it doesn't need to, you know, we don't need to know their proprietary algorithms, but we need a standardized output so that we can really interact with that data and give feedback to patients, to clinicians, to researchers. So there needs to be some sort of standardization going on around there, I think, to really have a long-term impact and I think it's coming in time, but we're not there yet. So I would accelerate that movement to happening a little bit quicker. Um, and smartphone data, you know, smartphone data I think is just untapped yet. We're still figuring out what exactly we wanna summarize, what can we interpret? So there's a lot of research that can go on there still. So I'm not sure if I would spend that 50 million there yet. Those are some great answers. <laughs> Less scientific, perhaps, but. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you so much for a really interesting yeah. presentation and a really rich discussion too. So that that was um, that was great. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you everyone. We'll Thanks say. for all the questions. <laughs> a virtual yeah. round of applause and <laughs> have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Bye everyone. <laughs>